Okay. So, hey, everybody. Uh, we are here today to do a hands-on workshop for Fedora Core OS. Um, and I'll quickly go into who are we. Uh, so my name is Dusty Mabe. I'm a software engineer for Red Hat, and I work on uh, Fedora Core OS and Fedora Cloud, and also Red Hat Core OS, uh, which kind of leads into the OpenShift product here at Red Hat. Um, I'll hand it off to Timothy to introduce himself. So I'm Timothy Ravier. You can call me Tim. And I'm also a Fedora Core OS uh, engineer working at Red Hat. Merci. Uh, thank you, Timothy. I'm Nasser Hussain, uh, mostly known as Nasser HM in the Fedora ecosystem. I mostly work with the Fedora Join SIG in order to help uh, getting started with the newcomers and improving that experience. If you're a newcomer, talk to us at Fedora Join SIG. Uh, Dusty, back to you. Okay. Thanks, guys. Okay. Uh, I'll do a brief introduction to Fedora Core OS. Uh, if you happen to ch catch my talk yesterday, this might be a little repetitive, but I'll try to keep it under 10 minutes. Uh, and then I'll introduce the workshop and we'll have uh, Timothy and Nasir uh, actually go through uh, the workshop here, or you can execute it on your own um, on your computer at home. So real quick, uh, what is Fedora Core OS? It's an emerging Fedora edition. Uh, Fedora Core OS came from the merging of uh, two communities. Uh, one of them was Core OS uh, Inc., the company's uh, uh, offering called Container Linux. And the other was Project Atomic's Atomic Host. Um, Fedora Core OS incorporates the Container Linux philosophy, provisioning stack, and cloud native expertise, uh, and also incorporates the Atomic Host Fedora Foundation the uh, update stack from Atomic Host and also enhanced security with SC Linux. Uh, so what are some of the features of Fedora Core OS? Uh, one feature of Fedora Core OS, which is a little bit different than traditional Fedora, is it uh, has automatic updates on by default. This kind of means that uh, by default, uh, things tend to be a little more secure when automatic updates get applied because uh, CVEs and security fixes and, and the like uh, hit systems faster than when usually somebody reacts to it. Um, but in order to achieve automatic updates, they must be reliable. Um, so how do we make them reliable? We have extensive tests in our CI pipeline. Um, and we also have several update streams which allow for people to run um, future update streams before they get to stable so that they can report issues and they know if they're gonna break and they let us know so that we can try to fix it if it's gonna affect a lot of people. Um, we also have managed upgrade rollouts over several days, which means uh, you know, if we start an upgrade and the first 10% of people that get the upgrade have failures, we can stop it. So the other 90% don't actually have to deal with that, um, which uh, is just a mechanism for us to be able to control the upgrades and see um, or get more information on how successful they are before continuing. And then, you know, when things go wrong, we, we have an escape plan. Uh, so if things aren't working for you for your application after an upgrade, uh, you can run RPM OS3 rollback, and that can be used to go back uh, to what you had before, which obviously was working because you were happy. And um, in the future, we want to be able to do this in an automated fashion. So based on uh, how a user, you know, specific things that a user defines, specific health checks that a user defines, we wanna be able to run a few health checks on boot and say, oh, these health checks that the user defined as checking if their application was actually up and running failed. And they have basically said that they would like to go back if that's the case. Uh, so in the future, we'd like to be automatically be able to roll back. Um, I want to go a little bit more in detail on update streams. So we have three update streams that we offer. One is Next, which is experimental features or Fedora major rebases. Uh, so for example, uh, once Fedora 33 beta comes out, we'll probably switch our Next stream over to F33 content. Um, we have our testing stream, which is essentially a preview of what's coming to stable. Uh, so if you want to get a, a win, uh, a window or a look into what's coming two weeks down the line to the stable repository, 
uh, you'll run the testing stream and that will let you know if your stable nodes are gonna break. Um, stable is the most reliable stream we offer and it's just essentially a promotion, promotion of testing content after some time. Um, the goals with these stable these streams is to publish new releases into update streams every two weeks and to also try to find issues uh, as soon as possible before they hit disable. Um, the next feature I want to talk about is automated provisioning. So Fedora Core OS uses Ignition to automate provisioning. Uh, and theoretically, uh, all of the configuration for the machine is baked into the Ignition config. Um, that means it's very easy to automatically reprovision a node. Uh, so if you lose a node, no sweat, you know, other than if it happened to have data that's not backed up somewhere. Um, obviously, we can't, <laughs> we can't save your data. But in general, the configuration uh, is very easy to reproduce. And, you know, hopefully you didn't lose data as part of that. Um, and Ignition, you know, because we use Ignition, it's also the same starting point, whether we're on bare metal or cloud, we use an image-based approach. Uh, so whether you're on bare metal or cloud, you start from approximately the same image. And uh, since we use Ignition um, everywhere, uh, you get a more unified uh, in experience, whether you're in the cloud or on bare metal. So a little bit more details about Ignition. Uh, it's a JSON document, basically. It's usually provided via some sort of user data mechanism. Um, it runs exactly once during the initRemFS stage on first boot, uh, which means that if provisioning fails, the boot fails. There's no half provision systems, uh, which can sometimes lead to confusion and possibly worse, uh, you know, side effects down the road if, you, if one little part of your configuration didn't actually apply. Um, ignition configs are machine friendly, uh, but not very user friendly, which means that we probably need to make uh, something that is a little better for our users to interact with. So we created a tool called Fedora Core OS Config Transpiler, which translates ignition spec into, or sorry, which translates uh, human, YAML, uh, sorry, human friendly YAML into ignition spec. Um, and Fedora Core OS Config Transpiler doesn't only translate, you know, it's not just a YAML to JSON uh, translation. Uh, we also have some distro specific uh, helpers in there and just some things that are, you know, make the user's life uh, better experience. One of those is if you add a new file system and you want it mounted, instead of having to create the system D mount unit yourself, you can just tell Fedora Core OS config transpiler, you want a mount unit and it will automatically generate one for you. Um, the next feature is uh, being cloud native and container focused. So in general applications run in containers. So we have the Podman or Moby engine container runtimes for that. Um, and because of ignition, uh, we can you know, easily deploy new nodes and have them join a cluster. So you can spin up 100 nodes or spin them down depending on your needs. So it's a little cloud burst uh, functionality is, uh, is supported natively. Um, we also try to be ubiquitous. So we're trying to offer Fedora Core OS wherever you want to run your workloads. And right now we have you know eight, nine different platforms that you can run those on. We're trying to add more all the time. Uh, the next feature is OS versioning and security. So Fedora Core OS uses RPM OS tree technology, which I like to call like Git for your operating system. So if you can imagine a single content hash that basically def is, uh, you know, a single identifier that tells you all the software in a particular release, uh, that's pretty powerful, especially when somebody's creating a bug report and trying to relate information. We don't have to ask them you know, what version of system D did you have with this kernel? We know, basically they give us a version number or a, or a hash and we can reproduce the exact problem that they are having, um, you know, unless it's like specifically environmental that we don't have access to. Um, RPM OS tree also uses a read-only file system mount which pre prevents accidental OS corruption. So accidentally RMRFing some, something you shouldn't have or like uh, unsophisticated attacks from uh, you know, modifying the system. Obviously, more sophisticated attacks would be able to do more, but that's where SE Linux comes in. Uh, so if your application inside of a container gets uh, compromised somehow, uh, SE Linux will hopefully keep the 
uh, you know, keep the compromised um, application just limited to itself and not accessing either the host or other applications on the system. Okay, so what's next for Fedora Core OS? We wanna add more cloud platforms. We're working on that all the time. Uh, we're, we want to add support for the other architectures that exist in Fedora. Uh, we have a proof of concept for ARM64 right now, and hopefully that'll prove out um, you know, the concept and we'll be able to add the other uh, platforms. We wanna have more human-friendly helper functions in FCCT. Uh, we wanna do better, uh, you know, have host extension like ability for things that just can't run in containers for whatever reason. Uh, so more reliable package layering right now, package layering is it very reliable because of uh, differences in the remote YUM repositories and, um, and the base layer on the host. Uh, improved documentation, tighter integrations with upstream projects, all kinds of things. Okay, so for the workshop today, we have five different tutorials. Well, the first one's kind of like just setting your system up, but we have a few different tutorials that uh, we'll have you run through. Um, the initial setup is just set up instructions, download this file and um, you know set up a few aliases and whatnot. Uh, the second one is enabling auto login and custom host name. So we'll basically show you how to write your first ignition config. Well, Fedora Core S config and then translate it into ignition and then start an instance. Uh, we'll have you start a service on first boot. Uh, we'll, ha we'll have you learn how to SSH into a machine and also automatically start a container. And then we'll uh, explore the system a little bit and show you how updates work. Um, and as the, for the workshop itself, we have a few different options. One of them is just executing it on your own as we would have done if we had an in-person workshop. Uh, so with an in-person workshop, usually we kind of go through this uh, you know, introduction at the beginning, just like I'm doing right now. And then everybody goes and follows instructions and then they raise their hand when they have questions. Uh, for this particular one, that's still an option. You can run it at home, uh, you know, and then you can come back to us and ask questions. But we decided since it was virtual, we would also have, um, for the people that want it, uh, the live stream here will actually be just us running through the steps of the tutorial ourselves and then people can kind of pop up and ask questions we really do want in, want to encourage people asking questions as we go because we know this content <laughs> and we want others to learn it um, so you asking questions as we go uh, is really the best way for us to to get information out there so there's a link to the uh, tutorials on our docs website there in the slide. Um, there's a HackMD document, which I pasted earlier, in which um, one of Timothy or Nasir will actually paste into the chat here soon again, which kind of gives a little more detail, what you need for this workshop, where you can go when you have questions during the workshop and then after the workshop. Um, so head over to that HackMD and, and that should, um, actually give you everything you need and I'll paste it. Uh, and let's see, okay, and I have a, a slide for getting involved. So if you want to get involved in Fedora Core OS after this, maybe you execute this workshop and, and you really like it. Uh, we have um, you know a website, we have a issue tracker, forum, mailing list, IRC. If you search Core OS, Fedora Core OS on Google, you should be able to find how to get engaged with us, um, you know, all else fails. If you have an IRC account on Freenode, join us in pound Fedora dash core OS. And I'm gonna hand it over to, I think Nasir first. I'll stop sharing my screen. Actually, real quick, does anybody have, uh, are there questions in the chat that we should address first on the video session maybe? So there's, there's one. Uh... Ask, uh, if we are we related to optimize OS, and so we're mostly not related. So that we are two different projects, and they have their own operating system, their own version of system for Kubernetes. But uh, we 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 are distinct projects. There are similarities, but different system. Yep. 
Uh, we have a question. Can I use Silverblue to follow this tutorial? Uh, so if Silverblue is your host OS and you're able to launch uh, virtual machines like with Libvirt, you should you should just be fine. Quick, quick comparison between CoreOS, Fedora CoreOS, and Continuous Optimized OS from Google. Uh, first, Continuous Optimized OS from Google, you can only get on Google Cloud. So if you're not running on Google Cloud, you're out of luck. Fedora CoreOS runs on a lot of platforms. Second, um, you uh, Fedora CoreOS is based on Fedora. So that's all the Fedora packages, all everything that's in Fedora that you can get on Fedora CoreOS. And that's the same thing. You get exactly the same thing. So if somebody works uh, on Fedora to fix something or to have a new package, you can get it on Fedora Chorus. It's the same. And we are less focused than, I would say, the, the container uh, optimized OS from Google in the sense that Fedora Chorus can be a Kubernetes node, but it can be something else. And you can make anything you like from, from it. Uh, it's not specifically targeted at Kubernetes. You can do that. It's a great way to do that, to, to be a Kubernetes node, but that's not uh, forced on you. Nasir, do you want to go through the setup um, and the first view for the user? Ah, great. Thank you very much, Dusty and Timothy for your question answers and the introduction. So what I'm going to do is now share my screen. Uh, am I audible? That's great. So let me share my screen now. Uh, is my screen visible? Yep, we can yep, see it. That's good. That's good. So uh, in the Fedora course official documentation, we have a section called uh, tutorials where you can get started with Fedora OS and how the how things work in the ecosystem. So uh, we are going to start with the first uh, tutorial setup and which is uh, we would be using the Fedora OS email, uh, archives and would be virtualizing it on libvirt. So in order to follow this tutorial, you can be on uh, you need to be on a Linux host, which is in which libvirt is enabled. So uh, you can virtualize using kvm or uh, so if you need some help with support uh, with enabling the hard hardware virtualization support here you can there's how you can do uh, and uh, you would need some coos tools in order to get started so it asks for creating a directory which i've created here so it's a nest demonstration hackfest where i have the aliases set like um, uh, there are some tools that you need to work with, as Justin mentioned in his uh, in his introduction about uh, FCCT, the Fedora Core's config transpiler. What it does is it uh, transpiles the YAML uh, ignition config in a uh, in a not very human readable uh, ignition config. Uh, you write the code in uh, human readable YAML, and uh, the transpiler transpiles it to a ignition config. And there's another tool, Ignition Validate, which you use to validate the Ignition files before provisioning your uh, Kubernetes, before provisioning your Fedora CoreOS instance in order to ensure that things were, the Ignition file uh, isn't having any issues with the syntax or so. Uh, and the other thing is the CoreOS installer. What it does is it pulls the latest, Q, uh, latest CoreOS stream image you would like to pull. So, Let's start. So I have these aliases set up. You can um, pull these images. Uh, let me see if I can do that. So I have these images pulled locally. So as you can see, these are already pulled on my side with Podman. And you can set your aliases to course installer to running a Podman container, which would uh, which would save the um, CoS uh, really uh, CoS stream archive locally, and uh, this is ignition validate, which will be validating our ignition configs. And the latest and last one is the Fedora CoS transpiler. So I'm going to set that as well. And the other thing is that in order to get the Qca, the 
Qcow archive that we would be using to virtualize the Fedora course instance. Hey, Nasty. Uh, yeah. Um, when you when you switch over and you copy and paste, uh, can you make the font size on your oh. terminal window just a little larger? Uh, sorry, let me fix that. Uh, uh, SG. Oh, I forgot this point. <laughs> no, no, no. Uh, one second. No, no, no. Yeah. yeah. When, you just copy and pasted the alias commands to that one window, right? If you just uh, change the font size a little larger, it should you should be able to see things. Uh, so uh, for that, I would like to just go um, not share my screen for a second and then fix my config of a simple terminal. Yeah, no worries. Thank you. Sorry. Control plus do the trick, but Bernard, I'm not using the GNOME terminal. It's um, SG, so I just need to type uh, SG. And SG, myself, mono space. And change the font size very often, so 15 would work fine. Let's see. Oh. So if, we, if we can't change it, that's fine too. I I, uh, I thought it yeah. would be yeah, it is. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> here it is. Now is it clear? that looks that looks a lot better, yeah. So I'm gonna go back to <laughs> still presenting that. Sorry for so uh, what you can do is now using the alias of course installer you you can download the uh, qcow archive and this is how oops i am not on bash uh, uh sorry for the inconvenience that bash it runs on that there so cd documents uh, Dora, OS, uh, uh, Nest uh, demonstration hack first. So now we are going to be setting the aliases as well. OS for, oops, this one. And uh, this one. So what it's going to do is run those containers for us. And now we can pull the CoS installer QCOW image, uh, the virtualized one. So we are going to pass the download key. And then what I want is the chemo uh, image with the, uh, that I would like to decompress as well. So this is going to pull that. And uh, for the convenience, I have that uh, image downloaded. So it's going to start the download here. But uh, what I have is this image downloaded pre session, so it's not uh, you can easily it would be in a QCOW 2 format. So, what I did was move that image to a Q, uh, Fedora as a Fedora rename that as Fedora Chorus minus QCOW 2. So, uh, this is how you can do that. And 
if you are on Fedora, we have all of those packaged in the Fedora um, official repositories. So you don't need to run them on Podman, but also it's recommended to run those tools from containers because uh, that ensures that the latest versions are there. With packaging, it needs to like get approved and ensure that everything works fine and stuff. So if you would like to manually build, manually download those images rather than using the CoreOS installer, you can use curl or wget depending on how you need it. So uh, you can do that by uh, creating a variable as release and then pulling that from Fedora's uh, build, uh, CoreOS build repo. So uh, now let's ensure that uh, 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 the image that the archive we got is signed from Fedora. So I'm going to import this thing, uh, the Fedora uh, GPG keys, and then uh, I'm going to ensure that things work fine here. Oops. So that means I have, okay, I don't have the release uh, variable set up. It turns out I don't have that far. Uh, that's for man. Sorry, everyone. So uh, let's move on. <laughs> Rather than verifying, I have those images verified pre, uh, pre the session. So I don't have the SIG files yet. And you can set the FCCT. Um, so we have already these set already. So as you can see now, I have FCCT available as well. Uh, Manch, Manch version. And uh, Ignition Validate version. And the CoS installer. So now we don't need CoS installer as we have got the image and I've moved that as Fedora CoS or Uh So this was the initial setup, which I had some issues with because I have had these things set up free nest so in order I don't break things at the session, but things turned out not the way I expected. So let's uh, get started with the initial provisioning scenario so, with, in which we would now see real quick. Um, so just a recap of mm -hmm. that setup session. So basically what we've done at this point is um, for, for the workshop, there's three different tools that we use uh, in the workshop. One of them is FCCT, one of them is Ignition Validate, and the other is CoreOS Installer. The reason we use CoreOS Installer is just to uh, handle downloading the image for us and verifying that it is, you know, uh, the actual image that was delivered by release engineering. Um, but there's a few different options for that. You don't have to use CoreOS Installer to download the image. It just happens to be one that downloads the image, uncompresses it, and also verifies that it was signed with the Fedora release engineering key. So it's just a nice, um, it's a nice tool to use for that. As far as these tools go, there's three different ways that you can use them. One is in a container, as Nasir showed earlier. Uh, one of them is with RPMs. So if you happen to be on Fedora, you should be able to DNF install each one of those. And then the third is you can pull um, the actual binaries from GitHub, their GitHub releases for each project if you want to. Um, so that's all this tutorial did was just get us set it up, uh, downloaded an image, and then our tools are set up for the other tutorial. Uh, thank you, Dusty, for the recap and explanation. So, uh, this is how you set up your environment to get started for the workshop. And now we are going to be moving on to uh, creating, uh, running a basic provisioning scenario in which we are going to be uh, auto logging, uh, sorry, uh, auto adding a system D drop in unit, which will uh, get us auto login in the TTY term terminal and provide us the terminal access. So, whenever you need to provision the Fedora CoS instance, uh, you have to give that an ignition file that uh, uh, Dusty, um, Dusty introduced earlier, because as the archives are distributed, you are not actually modifying the archive, but uh, provisioning it by using a way to call ignition config files, uh, which we can 
create by using FCCT. So in this very first burning scenario, what we are going to do is like get the very basic things done. And that is to add a system D unit drop in to get override the default uh, serial get TTY service that we have and which will auto log in the core user that in the serial console that we have. And the third thing that we are going to do is like uh, add um, set the system host name to tutorial and uh, add a, profi a bash profile that's going to tell system D that that do not use a pager for output because you if you don't use that, you're going to see some uh, warning output there as well. And uh, raise the kernel console logging uh, level to hide audit messages that we have because that's going to mm, take a second and it's going to uh, write those uh, audit messages on the terminal on the console as well. So we are going to raise the kernel uh, console uh, logging level as well. So what we are going to do is create a uh, FCCT auto logging YAML file that we have. So let me see what we have here. So uh, I have it here as FCCT auto login, FCCT auto login here. So what it's going to do is create a variant called FCOS in which we set the version to 1.1.0. You could set it anything you would like. And what we are going to do is create a systemd dropping unit in which we are overriding the serial get TTY service that we have. Uh, and uh, we are going to create an give the name as auto login core.com in the dropping unit in which we add the contents uh, in the service we are going to override the exec uh, the execution start uh, in the main unit and then add a new execution start with a uh, dot uh, with a minus prefix which is going to ignore failure so what we are going to do is uh, prevent uh, get tty to uh, not do the default exec start and uh, run the uh, usr slash bin in get tty with auto logging the core user and uh, we are going to use that as in the terminal in the storage section we are going to be modifying the files uh, at host name we are going to set the mode to 0644 and the contents we are going to add tutorial in order to set our host name to tutorial uh, and in the system d pager we are going to tell system d to uh, not use a pager when printing information and uh, with the silence uh, we are going to create another file which is silenceaudit.conf which is going to add the uh, kernel.printk is equal to 4 which will raise the kernel logging level from debug to warning in order for us to hide the audit messages uh, from the console that we are going to be using so as you can see, this is a really human readable format. Uh, like you can easily go through this uh, YAML file and understand what it's doing. Uh, this is how that the thing that Dusty, men, Dusty mentioned that uh, we are going to be using a human readable format. So as we have got the uh, YAML file locally, so now we are going to be using the FCCT Fedora Core's config transpiler in order to change that into an ignition file. So what we are going to do is I'm going to be using the pretty format along with the script keyword and uh, going to provide the YAML file, which is going to output the ignition file. So what it did is uh, it converted that to ignition file, ignition config file. And as you can see, this is not as readable as you would like it to be. So it's not that human friendly. So we are using the FCCT in order to transpile and hash that data here so let's provision a basic instance here so before that we are going to validate that the ignition file we, gener we just uh, generated with the transpiler is valid or not so what we are going to do is this one the ignition validate the tool that we get that we installed or um, downloaded earlier in order to make sure ignition file works fine so it says success that our ignition file can be used to provision. So now what we are going to do is uh, set up the correct uh, SC Linux label in order for the word installed to access that auto login dot ignition file. So I'm going to do that real quick. And uh, 
Now what we are going to do is provision a Fedora Chorus virtual machine in which the name would be Afcos. We would be creating, we would be using two virtual CPUs, two GB of RAM, and the OS setting the OS variant as Fedora 32, and setting the network bridge to VIR DR0. So in order to make sure that things are working fine at your side, you're going to make sure that the styles of your libword D is libword D. Yep. So it is active. It uh, the virtualization daemon is loaded and is currently inactive. But we are going to and that uh, the socket uh, is listening. And whenever we provide something to the socket, it's going to make the service active. So let's provision this basic uh, WordPress install, which is going to run the uh, in the command line. It's going to provision that, and in the course config, we are going to be running the ignition file. The disk size is twenty. And the backing store, we are using the backing store as we don't want to play with the base uh, with the QCOW2 image archive that we have and use another 20 GB disk uh, that we would attach. So I'm going to copy paste that command here. And what it will do is in our systemd unit, we used the, uh, we asked that to attach the TTY console here. So it's going to do that and as you can see it started Nasir. the provision and um, it, so one uh one question that we had in chat so at least OS. one user has a system where it doesn't recognize uh the dash dash os dash variant uh option to vert install uh so mm -hmm. if you happen to get an error when you pass dash dash os dash variant equals fedora 32 you can just drop that argument completely uh, so if, if you're having the same problem, just drop that argument and it, it'll still work. Uh, that just makes the VM boot a little faster. Hmm. Uh, thank you, Dusty, for answering the question. The OS flag is like totally optional. That just uh, lets what, what install know that we are using the Fedora code, Fedora Ted 2. So as you can see, it has provisioned using the ignition and uh, to ensure that the ignition config worked uh, so as you can see the tutorial login for it uh, says the auto login automatic login here and let's ensure that things are working fine so as you can see we have got a uh, tty console here so let's get the system ctl about the tty service that we have uh, so here you can see that uh, the uh, the service that the auto login dot minus core conf that we provided using the ignition config file we have it here which is going to override the exact start uh, in the main unit uh, with somewhere above it and what it will do is like uh, it will get um, it will set the auto login to core and it's going to provide us the terminal uh, interface here so. As you can see, it has providers and the ignition config seemed to work fine. Here it is. And let's verify the other thing that we did was to set the host name to tutorial. So you can do that by host name CTO. Uh, so here you can see it's the static host name is tutorial. And uh, you can also do that by getting to etc slash host name. Oops, oops. So that seemed to work fine. Now what we are going to do is, as you can see, Fedora Core seems to work fine, and our ignition config file has provisioned the instance the right way. So we are going to verify that the uh, RPMs that are distributed, that are packaged into the Fedora Core are working fine, which is one is ignition, which we use for provisioning. The second one is kernel. The third is Mobi engine RPM, which is going to provide you the Docker engine and the Docker commands. Along with that, we have Podman, Podman, Systemd, RPM OS3, like uh, Dust, uh, Dusty, uh, Dusty introduced that it's like a Git for your operating systems. And there's NCAT service, which is the auto updating service that we have within the Fedora OS internals. So let's ensure that we have the right versions here. So what you can do is if something seems to be failing, you can like uh, share with us that the ignition is not working fine. You can tell us the exa uh, exact version, which uh, version you, that seems to be failing. Along with that, we are using RPM OS3. So 
RPM OS 3 stands. Oops, it's not a flag, it's flag. Sorry. So as you can see in the OS 3, we have the version as Fedora 32. This is the stream version and the update. And we have the commit hash here. So if something seems to be failing, you can provide us the commit hash and we can in, we can verify that. How can we fix that and provide you some fixes? So you can say, you can do that by the commit version. And uh, in order to ensure that the system CTL service for Zencati is working fine, so we are going to ensure that as well. So what I was doing is like, uh, as you can see in the update the default the auto updates is uh, enabled by default and uh, i'm not sure about this error dusty would you like to specify what this error is it seems like yeah a network it, it just looks like uh, maybe zincati started before the network was completely up um but yeah that, that's safe to ignore basically zincati will periodically uh pull uh the update server and if it has uh, an error on startup, it'll resolve itself later. Okay, so it's just uh, log that information. If you wanted to, you could yeah. system CTL restart uh, Zincati, and it should not show that error. Zincati, and uh, you'll have to do it with sudo on the front. Oops. 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 So I didn't like. Let's try it now. Status Zincati service. So as you can see, initialize auto update. So it seems to be working fine now. Oops. Minus minus four. Uh, why is it? pipe cat? So the systemd pager workaround that we did was only for the core user. So when you sudo, um, that's not set. Ah, oh, got it. So what now it's working fine that the Zincati was initialized before my network was configured. So it resulted in that error, but it's like, uh, it has its like internal loop in which it will pull all the, the updates. So it will auto update when, when it gets one. So it seems to be working fine. Another thing that we can do is in order to investigate the logs that we have um, from the ignition config, we can use the general CTO in order to work uh, these logs. And I'm pretty sure it's gonna be long, so I'm gonna pipe that in more. So uh, as you can see, uh, ignition started the it started the Zincati update server. It uh, tells us about the information and the logs that we have of Ignition. So uh, whenever the Ignition created the files, did all the process that we uh, specified in the Ignition config file. And uh, what it did was it then you mounted itself and uh, the Ignition finished and successfully. So here you can see. <sighs> So the next thing that we can do is like ensure that the Podman uh, and the Podman uh, container runtime is working fine. So we have that here as well. Podman version is going to tell us the Podman version is currently 1.9.3. It's running on Go 1.4, 14.2. It was built on Go 1.14.2. And you can get the Podman log test. It's not log, it's info. So yeah, as you can see, here's the info about the Podman that we'll be running. Another thing here is that you can also in Docker and the Docker, uh, the Docker in the Docker service that we have can be initiated by using the Docker command or the sudo Docker command, or unless you are in the Docker group as well. Uh, so. When um, the issue with Docker running Docker and Podman is that it can result in unexpected behaviors in both of them. So you can check this uh, frequently asked questions entry that uh, if you are running both at the same time, it can cause some issues and unexpected behavior is highly 
recommended to not use them at the same time uh, that in in fedora os we do have docker dot service disabled by default but if you would like to start you can run any docker command and it's gonna and the docker socket is listening to it and it's gonna enable this service here so let's continue uh here it tells about the same thing in the note and what i'm gonna do is now unattach the uh the console that we have that i can do with control and the square closing bracket so it's gonna unattach that and it is unattached now and what i'm gonna do is now destroy that uh of course so it's gonna destroy that thing and we are gonna be removing all the storage that we generated that we created uh, for the session and it's gonna do that as well so it's now removed so dusty would you like to add something here about the first uh, provisioning scenario that i uh, no, I think uh, I think we're pretty good. I mean, uh, pretty much all we did in this lab was go through, create our first uh, FCCT uh, config, and then um, you know switch that over, run FCCT to create ignition out of it, and then explore what it did to the system on boot. Um, yeah, look good. That's great. So now we can move on to a second tutorial, which is. Uh, focus towards uh, uh, running a, a script and a bash script on boot. So, um, what we are going to do is we are going to be using icanhazip.com to update the issue gen uh, from console login helper messages. That's going to uh, output the node's public IP address. That's, that's really helpful when you are working on a cloud environment where you have uh, different public or private addresses. So we are going to be storing that script in USR local bin and as a public IPv4.4 IPv4 sh when we would be provisioning the machine using uh, Ignition. So in order for that to uh, run on boot, what we are going to do is we are going to be creating a system D service as well, uh, which will ensure that uh, console login helper messages issue service is working fine and uh, which will be running before that and after network is online and the condition path that exists is issued in public ipv4 uh, in the service what we are going to do is set the type to one shot in the exact start uh, we are going to be running the public ipv4 script that we would be creating and uh, after executing that we are going to use touch to create a issued in public ipv4 uh, file and that will be remaining after exit yes and uh, install that which is wanted by console login helper messages issued in the service so we will call this unit uh, that we are creating uh, and we will embed it into the fedora covers config in a yaml format so let's see that ignition file here uh fccp services that we have let's focus on that so we are going to be creating the same variant we are setting the version to 1.1.0 in the system d drop in unit we are going to do the same thing in which we will override the exact start in the main unit and uh, uh, set the auto login to true with the core core user and uh, we are going to create another unit here uh the drop let's say as far as I know, it's a, it's a system D unit in which we are going to set the, it will be running before console login helper message services uh, enabled and after network is online. So we can have our IP address there. And uh, it's going to execute the I, public IPv4.sh file, which we haven't created yet, and which we would be doing in the storage file section here. Uh, here it is. So it's going to create a, a local file, a file in local slash bin slash public ipv4.sh directory in which the mode is set to executable. And this is what the file looks like. It's going to detect our public ipv4 address and print that out to console login helper messages. We're going to show that in, when we provision the machine. 
other than that what we are trying to what we are going to do is set the host name to tutorial like we did earlier set the system d pager to cat and telling the system d to not use a pager when we are printing information and the other thing is we are going to set the kernel the kernel's logging level from debug 7 to warning with 4 to hide the audit messages so this seems pretty simple uh, would you add would someone like to add something uh, okay sorry i thought i heard some noise there so it seems good now we are gonna be uh, so as it seems pretty readable this is where the fcct comes in we are gonna change that into a ignition config file sorry uh it's gonna be uh pretty and we are gonna set the layout to strict and oops and uh, we are going to set the output as services.ignition config and you can verify that the files created service oops services.ign so as you can see it doesn't seem as readable as the ml file so this is what we would be providing the word install in order to provision the fedora os instance so uh, now let's validate that our ignition file is working fine. So ignition validates services.ign uh, eco success if you would like it to. So it's success is succeeded. So if uh, the ignition file has any problems, ignition validate is gonna show that to you in the console. So let's set the correct uh, SE Linux label that we have. Again, so it's going to change the security context in order for word install to access it. And now we are going to be using word install to create to provision our Fedora OS instance the same way, but we are going to be providing it a different ignition config file here with the same um, same. Uh, some config same specs like we are going to be providing still the two virtual cpus the ram would be 2048 along with the os variant as fedora 32 if that gives an error you can it's pretty optional if you are on fedora i believe it wouldn't have any issues it's just to make the boot up process a little faster and word install know that we are running a fedora instance uh it's going to import a network bridge and uh, the graph we don't have any graphics there yet uh, and with the in the chemo command line, we are going to be using the uh, we are going to be providing the services.ignition file we have, setting the disk size to 20 GB, and we are going to be using the uh, QCow image as a backing store. So let's get started. Uh, it is connected to the domain, it seems to be provisioning stuff starting and. Um, uh, uh, this is where the ignition is working. This is from the SE Linux policies kernel. Uh, let's see about IPM OS3 system daemon is working. Seems to be working fine. Network is online now. And as you can see, hostname service uh, it seems to work fine. So as you can see, with the console login helper methods uh, messages, we we did get our public IPv address here. And as you can see, we can mm, verify the thing that our, the newly created service is working fine. So what it did was it created it used curl in order to create a request to I can has it and uh, send the uh, output to a, uh, a console log and console log. Uh, this is what we did. It was just to get your public ipv4 address along with attaching the tty console and uh, auto login and along with providing the detecting public ipv4 address using i can has it so this seems to be working fine now i can be and the file would be also be created also would have been created so if you would like to ensure that the file is created you can do that by cat uh, local it's in bin public ip assets. So here you can see the file that we created using uh, ignition. So that's it. Now I'm going to detach my 
control session here and uh, gonna destroy the instance that's running of course and i'm gonna undefine or remove all the storage that we have here so it's detached uh, so this was it from my side. I had ran the basic initial ignition config files and what demonstrated the basic provisioning scenarios that we have. And now I'm going to be passing that to Timothy to continue where I left off and continue with the second with the second two uh, provisioning scenarios that we have. So Timothy. Hey. Uh, Thanks, Nasi. Old. Great. Um, awesome. Do you have any questions so far? Okay. Somebody has just finished it also. <laughs> that's that's good. Um, all right. Uh, let's go and move on to the next part. So I'm going to be set up to do the setup and let me know if that's good. So I'll start that. Okay. Yeah, we can see your screen. Great. All right. Is both at the same same time doing something? Um, maybe I'm going to make it this bigger here. How big is this? Or maybe that's... Maybe on the right hand side of the terminal window, I would maybe go at least one step up. Okay. Yeah, that's there? probably yeah, that's probably good. On the left hand side, maybe one make, step make it up bigger. Well. Yeah, I can do make this one bigger here. Yeah, I think that's good. Yeah. Looks good here. All right. So for the next two steps, so we are going to do uh, SSH access and uh, in starting containers, and uh, then we will do some updates. So first, let's work on SSH. So we are basically going to reproduce the same steps that we did before, but with a different uh, Fedrak OS and ignition config. So let's start with SSH access. So with the with the by default, you only get one user, which is set up by default. It's a core user, but there has there is no specific access uh, authentication or access configuration set. So you have to do uh, everything. You have to tell the system everything if you want to get access to it. So for now, we've been setting mostly auto logins on the console. So that's great for development for testing, but that may be not so great for running in production. So what you want usually is to set up an SSH key to get access remotely to a system if you deploy it as a server somewhere. So that's we what we are going to do. We are going to add an SSH key for the core user. And at the same time, to make it a little bit more spicy, we will create a specific system D service uh, that will fail and we'll see how the system handles that. And uh, finally, we had another system day unit uh, that will bring up a container uh, for running an actual service on a system, something that we want to do. We don't just want to run Fedora Covers for the sake of running it. We want to actually have it do something. So let's write the Fedora Covers config and I'll go over the, the config with you here. So first we, so that's the basics. We are going, we. I've added here a new section to tell that we have, okay, we have users and we have one name core, that's the default. And we will add a specific authorized key here to get access uh, those, uh, remotely. So that's, that's the key that will be added to the authorized key um, um, file in the, in the user home directory. We still have our specific system D units. So the TTY unit to set up auto login. We'll still keep that for now. That's simpler for debugs. And we will create a, we have a failed unit, a unit that will fail. It will simply just go and call bin false. So it will fail and we'll see how that goes. And then we have something a little bit more complex. So maybe something I should do is, yeah. Uh, we, have here a, a new unit uh, that will run Podman 
that will run a container via Podman. So this unit will pull the etcd container and run it with a set of parameters. So it's basically a Podman command. Um, writing this unit by hand is maybe not that easy. So what you can do is you can use Podman generate system D, I think if I remember currently, or is it system D generate? Yeah, this one, and call it with the container name, and uh, and you get you get a unit like that. You get the same unit uh, written back to, written back to you. Um, so yes, our unit that will run etcd, and we have a couple of other things. So we still have a host name set up or pager set up, and some audit silencing. All right, so let's take this Fedora Chorus config here and copy it in the file. Yep. There we go. FCCT. Containers. Why do I get okay? I'm gonna do something else. Make sure that I get something clear. All right, that looks better. Okay, so I've got my config here. I've got my image and I will run FCCT straight pressy uh, my config and to put it at gn. All right, I've converted it to ignition format. So JSON, all good. And I will provision a system with this config. So some SLinux foo, and let's go and do the virt install. And let's copy everything at end. There we go. Oh, why do I get this? Okay, so our system has now booted successfully and it's applied the config. So what can we see here? First, we can see, let me just like go for screen. We can see that we have one failed unit. So that's all right, that's the unit that we wrote, the failure unit here, and we get a little bit of snippet here at the, at, on the console to tell us which unit has failed. So if I go and ask system to steal the status of failure, of course it failed. So that's good. Um, then we had SSH access set up. So let's, let's go over SSH. So I uh, will disconnect from this console um, and go over SSH. So here, the system is here and I've added my own. I made a mistake. I didn't set my real SSH key in the config, so I'm not going to be to, uh, able to access this stage, so I will have to do that right now. Uh, okay. And start. Yeah. 
let's destroy my system and reprovision it. Hey, I'm back up here, and we can see that we have a key here. My key has been added to the system, to the authorized key found. So I can disconnect, and I can directly SSH, so with the core user and my IP, which is here, to the system, and I will be authenticated. No password, as I didn't set any, and we disable password authentication by default. So all good. We got SSH access. We got failed units. That's good. Um, and let's have a look at our new service. So we uh, we added a, a specific system via unit that will run a netcd container via Podman. So. If I take a look at the status of this service here, so it looks good, it's active, it's running, and we have the log, so it looks good. One should be running. If I can, I can also look at it using Podman itself. So if I go Podman, oh, I have to run this as root because the system system B is running this service as root, Podman as root. So yeah, we've got here the container running. It's been half a minute, that's good. And um, let's, uh, yeah, let's do some etcd. Let's try some etcd commands. So if you don't know about etcd, to make it simple, to make it um, quick, uh, etcd is basically a distributed database uh, that you, where you can store key, key value pairs. So we, here we'll, with the first curl command, we will tell etcd, so we'll call etcd and, and ask it here, uh, to add a key and name it Fedora with the value of fun. So if we go this, copy here, and do this here. So it's called to our running instance of etcd and ask it, so in etcd answered itself, answered our query and say, okay, I've created this value here with this specific index. Very good, and let's ask again the value from its CD. So if we call all the keys that are in the database, and we go, we pipe it to GQ to make it a little bit pretty. So here we get all the keys, the keys, Fedora, and for another value, the one we get. So all good. So our ITCD instance is properly up and running. And that yeah. is because Fedora is fun, right? <laughs> Maybe we should we should change this value and put like Fedora chorus because like it's Fedora nice. chorus tutorial. I don't know if dash is our load in TCD keys, so we'll have to try that out. Okay, is there anything else? Any question in the chat or anything for for this this section here? I saw any questions in chat. Uh, we, we, as uh, as tutorials always do, they they in, invoke us to think a little bit more critically about what's going on, and we have some suggestions for some features. So, other than that, we don't have any uh, questions about the tutorial itself. Cool. All good. So let's move on to the last one. Um. So the last one. Oh, let me just destroy my system first. My, my running instance. So I can log out and destroy it. All good. The last one, the last tutorial is about running updates. So we've said the one of the, the one of the things that is great about Fedora CoreOS is automatic updates. That you don't have to worry about that. They will happen automatically. You can manage how they happen automatically and uh, it, it, you always get the latest stuff and the latest features, latest security fixes. So here, but 
we have a chicken egg issue. If we've downloaded, downloaded the latest version of Fedora Core S to, for this tutorial, so to make it, to see it in action, we have to go back and download an older release and do the do uh, everything again to have it to, uh, to start it to have it auto update itself to see it in action. Um, I think the release happens approximately every two weeks, so there there are, haven't been one yet. So maybe next week then there will be one. Um, so yeah, that's what I did here. So you you don't have we don't have anything. Um, automatic to download all the release because that's not something you usually do. So if you want to do that, you will have to go to the release page here, Fedora Core has, and look at the release notes. And here you see that's the latest release. So you just pick the one before here and you download this one. So I don't think that there's an easy one to go and download this one. You will just have to replace the versions into all the strings. So that's what I, I did the instruction here so that you just have to replace the release number here and you can go and kill those two files and I'll do it just right now. Let's download this one, should be quick. And let's download the GPG. Up. So once you've done that, don't forget to verify that you've downloaded. Did we go and unzip it? And there we go. I can just remove the one I had before. And simpler, I'll just rename it to something with a predictable name. All good. So I have now my older image. Let's do this again. So we are going to write an ignition config again. Well, Fedora chorus config and convert it to ignition. We'll do the auto login setup. That's to make it easier. We'll keep our SSH key. That's great. That's easy too. Keep the console login level and we'll remove all the units because we don't need them for this setup. So that's the config here. Nothing specific. We have the authorized key, the TTY config, visual, and the silence audit. So I'll just go over here and just like copy the one from containers and go with dates. But that's basically what it is. And just like remove failure unit, the HCD member unit, of them we don't need, keep the pager. And the silence of it, all good. So zip, quite simple config here. So FCCT, call FCCT. It's and about to updates. Well, good. We got a new config, and let's start a, uh, a system with that. So there's some system, some Sonic foo, and let's boot up a system. So here, depending on the connection, depending on how fast the system boots up and everything, we'll try and be quick and see the update happening live. So to do that, we watch, we will look at two services. So the first one is the status of the system. Yeah, OS3 status, oops, status of our OS3 
So it, the hip that has already started and the Zincati status. So here we have Zincati. It's running. So you say, okay, I'm initialized. And oh, there's an update. So, okay, I'm going to update the system right now. And if we pull that again, look at both. So, FPM OS3 status here, he says, okay, it's busy. We are deploying the updates. It's working on, on making it available. So that's the current version that we have booted. And the GATI is still working on it. So here we'll just have to wait for it to happen. Should be quite quick. And there we go. As you've noticed, my system just just rebooted by itself. And we now have two versions. OK, so let's do the same thing. Let's have a look at the status. So now we have two versions. We have the old version, the one we booted the first time. So from June. And the one from July here, so the last one, the, the, the update. And that's good. The, we have got a little star here, which means that's just the one that we are currently running. So that's the the, the, the basics about OS3, is that you can have multiple versions installed at the same time on the system, but only one running. And so that's the one running here. But we still have those versions available. And we can go back to them if we need. So that's what we will do in a second. Uh, let me just check what I had in mind. Yeah, so that's the status. We have did that. If you got a full EGFA terminal and not just a, a basic console, you will see a nice dot here instead of the star. And yeah, so you might be wondering what, what happened, what changed between the old version and the new version. Then you can get this information with um, by calling APM OS3 and asking for the changes. So if I do that here and ask for the changes, so there's a lot of them. If I just go back, let's just clear screen maybe, do it again. Yeah. So, okay, from previous deployment to the one, that's good. That's like a git diff. And we see we've got all those packages that have been updated for the new version. So that's good. You've got the exact difference between the previous version and the new version. That's Fedora static classic packages. And that's the same one you will get in, on Fedora Workstation or Fedora Sub. All right, but let's say something happened during the update and the latest version of whatever package that we've got inside as a bug and you need to go back uh, because you still have to make the system do useful stuff and sometimes updates are getting in the way and you just want to uh, to have it working right now while you take the time to fix things up then you can ask apm 3 to roll back and to roll back the previous versions that's we what we are going to do now so here, so we, we have to be root. We'll call it IPM3, roll back, and go ahead, reboot. We're ready. So it said moved one the one the previous version from the from the back to the top and rebooting. So here we go. If we have a look, quick look here, hey, we are running the older version now. So if I take a look at the status, I still have two versions available in my system, but the new version is now not enabled. It's not the one that has been booted because we've booted back on the whole version. And so what happens with Linkati? Linkati is smart enough. He can figure out that we made an update something happened, we had to roll back. And so now he, he will just, okay, auto updates are enabled, um, good. We have the new version available in the system, but there has been a rollback. So let's just not re-update again right now. Let's just wait for the next update. And when the next update happens, we will just like skip this one and go to the next one.
also interesting in this output right here, you can see starting update agent Zincati and then the version of Zincati. And you, uh, if you paid attention in the RPM OS tree DB diff output earlier, you saw that Zincati is actually one of the things that got upgraded and the new version was 0.0.12. .0 so this is kind of proof uh, that the rollback actually is using the older version of the software. Okay, I think I've done everything here. I don't, well, we've covered all of the topics. If there are any questions, we can go over that. Micah says, I wonder if she's in Cottage blog a message about detecting uh, a rollback. It, yeah, detecting and choosing not to go to an update. I, I think it should. I think that be a nice. It probably does if you enable the debug output, um, but I think an info level message would be useful in my opinion. Uh, as far as specific questions, like I said, I, it looks like we don't have any th uh, technical issues outstanding. Mostly people just asking questions about Fedora Core OS features and, and saying that they're interested in using it. Um, let's see, what time is it? It's 11.23. Uh, we'll just, I guess, hang out here for a little bit and see if anybody has any questions. If somebody wants to um, hop in and, and discuss things, you know, maybe discuss features or just ask other questions, um, you know, ask to join the, the session and we can just have a, you know, talk back and forth with audio and video. Uh, so feel free to ask to join and we'll just pop you into the session. We can only have nine at a time uh, presenters. So <laughs> I don't think we'll have that problem, but maybe. So I have a question. Uh, if anyone wants to get involved with Fedora Chorus, how can one get involved? Oh, we have Timothy. Timothy, you want to say? Um, so I would say they are several things to do uh, right now and so there's a bit for everybody so uh, if you're more into uh, writing code there's uh, there's a lot of federal chorus is made of a lot of programs so you can uh, have a look uh, at the code that, that we have so it's all happened there on the github.press org okay so it's is showing well yeah so on Chorus here. So there's lots of projects using Chorus and, and things like that. Maybe um, which one? Uh, the, the, the project that we use to to track the changes, track the, um, the, the things that are happening right now is the tracker. So if you go here, you'll see all the issue that we have and potentially the things that need to be worked on. There's a lot of things to do. Um, mm -hmm. If code is not your thing, that's specifically fine. You can help us with the docs. So you can do uh, either try out what we've just did the, the, the tutorials or just try out the docs and see if they work for you. So if you go to the Fedora docs and you go to Fedora Chorus, here you go. Got all of those docs. We are available on a lot of platforms, so you can grab the one you like and try it then and configure the system to your liking to who you want it to be.
I have a very practical uh, recommendation for if you want to get started with Fedora Core OS. <laughs> um, if you happen to have a server that is doing something simple, try try using Fedora Core OS to do that. Um, you know, maybe take your simple application or whatever that you're running on that particular server. For me, it was a IRC client. Uh, and just convert that server to use Fedora Core OS. And because you are using it and it's something that you actually, you know, utilize periodically, if not daily, you will learn and you will uh, become more familiar and you'll become a part of the community. It's, it's always the, this way to, to get involved is to work on the thing that you want to do and the thing that are bothering you and the bugs that you have. So, of course, uh, if you use it, uh, the, the easier list it will be. So yeah, so we, dogs, translation, yeah, sure, go ahead. Uh, I was gonna say, we have a question in chat about um, uh, what types of platforms or hardware is uh, Fedora Core OS tested on, like in the CI? So right now for, we automatically test on AWS and GCP, and we automatically test, uh, you know, VMs pretty heav heavily. So, like, um, we use uh, QEMU uh, to test VMs, but we also use QEMU to test the bare metal install workflow with VMs. So, we, we won't just start the QEMU image. We will also launch the bare metal, um, you know, the CoreOS installer install process to install the bare metal image into a VM. We don't currently automatically test on bare metal hardware directly. Um, that's something that we might uh, look into doing soon uh, by adding, for example, like packet or something like that. I guess theoretically we could change our AWS instances that we use to test uh, to cover uh, the bare metal instances that they have as well, but we don't currently do that. Yeah, we don't automatically test on VMware right now. If you know, <laughs> if you know some somewhere or something that is able to give us like access to a VMware environment uh, that we don't have to pay for, that we could automatically run our image against, then we would be happy to add that to CI. Uh, but yeah, we don't. I I don't know of a cloud that specifically offers VMware, although maybe that exists. I haven't sought it out directly. Um, but yeah, typically, at least with the, the two cloud platforms, and we have more coming uh, that we test on automatically, they kind of give us uh, accounts that are unbilled so that we can make sure our project works well there. And then um, in return, basically, they, uh, you know, our OS works on their platform so that when users want it, it, it exists, it's tested. Uh, we know it works. Um, so we have AWS and GCP right now, and we also have a pure OpenStack provider that's coming in the future called VexHost uh, that we'll use to test our OpenStack images. Um, but yeah, we, we would love to test, you know, VMware in the same fashion. Yeah, David says uh, AWS offers a VMware. That's nice. David, does that mean we can use uh, <laughs> we can use the 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 VMware offering for our current uh, agreement? Anybody here that's already using Fedora Core OS um, and want to kind of give a five minute spiel for, you know, how they're using it and what they like about it, maybe? Joe, do you want to come into the room?
I saw something pop up on my moderation panel, but did it, I think? Okay. Oh yeah, I see four of nine. I can so, stop sharing, maybe. Maybe it takes him a. Oh wait, now it says three of nine. Oh, there he is. Hey, hey uh, Jeff, can you guys hear me? Yep, we can. All right, cool. Sorry for the kids in the background. Um, I use uh, Fedora Core OS uh, on my work on forum.com. So we're providing community software, and the idea is that we want to give a stack of the software over to clients. And we're using Fedora Core OS as the base OS to run all the containers with Podman. So we use Ignition to um, kind of build the VM stack quickly. Um, and I, the, the cool, the best part about the stuff that we talked about uh, during the session was iterating quickly on your workstation. So I use a script, a bash script that I wrote that just kind of launches a, a VM on my workstation with Ignition so I can test quickly. And it takes about a minute for things to come up, come alive. Um, and the, um, so I can test quickly, and then we move to managing our infrastructure with Terraform and all that jazz uh, in AWS right now. So, and that uses Fedora Core OS. So, the the once you learn how to get used to the ignition config and uh, launching the software uh, that you want a lot that you want to you know spin up on Fedora Core OS, um, it becomes actually really nice because everything is declared. It's very easy to use. So. Um, do you, what, what kind of, uh, what kind of scale are you guys working at with, uh, forum? um, well, I mean, it's just launching right now. So, um, not much <laughs> to be honest. Uh, uh, we're hoping that, um, you know, we're going to be able to provide individuals with a free open source version of forum. So you could run it, you know, on a server in your basement and launch the forums, you know, our software stack quickly. Um, or run it on AWS or GCP or DigitalOcean or whatever. So that's like one of our like principal goals. And the reason why we chose Fedora Core OS is because we want to make sure that our users have an updatable stack, right? So we want to be able to dictate to them when they update not only the software that our developers are making, but also urge them to update Fedora Core OS as well. Thanks. Joe also authored a uh, documentation entry that we are in the process of reviewing to support uh, WireGuard VPN um, set up pretty easily with Fedora Core OS. So I look forward to digging into that one. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. One of my one of, one, taking all of my time here late. <laughs> one of the cool things that I would love to see is that you'd be able to launch like a WireGuard VPN with Fedora Core OS quickly, right? So. You know, you could spin up a DigitalOcean droplet, and you'd have your VPN configuration ready to go, um, and you know, enable people to securely access the internet through WireGuard, which um, you know was kind of the motivation for getting WireGuard support, like for the WG binary in Fedora Core OS. Yep, sounds good. Uh, uh, go ahead. And I see a question by Matthew Miller. Uh, as a production user, would you have any problem if there was a count me process that just told the same thing, DNF count me? Does there is a system running Fedora Chorus which exists? Uh, Matthew, feel free to, to ask to join and, and we can <laughs> talk with audio too. Um, in general, uh, we have plans for uh, what we call the pinger service, which basically oh. <laughs> I'm at my treadmill desk. Nice. Um, we have plans for a pinger service, which will give us some more information, uh, kind of similar to what container Linux had in the past. So for example, uh, I think it, it will probably be a little bit more, um, comprehensive than just the count me stuff. One thing that we want to, do is be able to tell if systems are successfully upgrading or not. Um, and that will kind of help us judge our in our upgrade window, um, you know, if in the first hour of the upgrade window, 
20% of nodes are failing to do an upgrade, we would like to be able to stop the upgrade. Um, so yeah, I think we, we have plans for a pinger, but we don't have it quite implemented yet. Um, but yeah, I would like for you to be involved in that. Let me read your comments. Oh, so, okay. His question is Joe Doss, does something like a pinger service raise any concerns for you? Um, I mean, it, for, for our, when we develop like the free open source version of forum, uh, we're going to disable any telemetry by default. Like we believe that like, Hey, if you want to be tracked, click this button or, you know, here's how you turn it on. Um, you know, make it opt in, you know, make it opt in versus opt out. Um, you know, for the SAS stuff that I'm working on for forum.com, um, we'll, we'll probably leave it on just cause like we would want, you know, Fedora to know, you know, what our status is. I'm okay with like providing the information back to Fedora, but like, I think by default, you know, you need to always turn it, you know, make an opt in. I think that this, this that's a huge thing. You know, you don't want to go the route that other Linux distributions have done, which is like kind of like forced, you know, things that are coming at the, the, the consumers, uh, like, you know, ads in your MOTD or, you know, forced tracking. I th yeah. I think it's yeah, super I'm important. I, I, ha I think I had a similar opinion to begin with about opt-in. Um, <laughs> there, there's definitely counter arguments against opt-in, which is like, well, nobody will do it, <laughs> right? Uh, and I think it, it depends on how it's done. Uh, so if I understand correctly, I don't think the DNF count me is opt-in. I think it's maybe opt-out. Matthew can probably confirm that. Um, I'm not super familiar with it, uh, but in general, I think the goal is try to try to make it as little information as possible, but also still useful. Um, and so things like, I think you can actually see if you look at, um, if you look at the request that is made from a system today, uh, to the update server, the, it actually, I think it actually tells the update server what version I'm currently on. Um, and I think that is w at least one piece of information that we want to collect. We just want to see how up to date systems are. Um, and I'm not sure what else, but I don't think it, we plan it to be anything that is, you know, would be considered bad. Uh, but yeah, obviously that's a tricky, tricky route to go down. Uh, and one that we should definitely, you know, have ongoing discussions about to make sure that it's done the right way. I do have a, a, a question, Dusty, that maybe you could expand on, uh, spe uh, specific around auto updates. Um, you know, do you folks have any plans on to how to fine tune auto updates right now? I think one of the biggest gotchas that I got as a new Fedora Chorus user is I was iterating in my in, uh, on my uh, you know setup, and then uh, Fedora Chorus updated, and then Zincati rebooted me, like. I, it took me a second to realize why am I rebooting in the middle of my initial boot, right? Um, do, do, is there any plans to make that a little bit more user friendly for people that aren't consuming Fedora Core OS in a clustered setup, like you know, for individuals that are really using it like as like a a, a VM that they're running on like DigitalOcean or something? Yeah, I think there's a two there's two things that we've at least talked about. One of them I know is implemented. Um, Although I don't know how it affects the very first run. I think it should be, yeah, it's, it should just apply to the very first run as well. But uh, one of the things that we've done is we've implemented something called a, um, a periodic uh, scheduling strategy for Zincati updates, which basically says you can define a period of time during a week or something like that. Uh, where updates are allowed. 
So if it if it's not, you know, 1 a.m. on a Saturday morning when nobody's using our system, uh, then don't allow updates. And if it is 1 a.m. to 2 a.m. on a Saturday morning, allow updates, right? Um, so basically you, the user, can control what period of time the updates will happen. Um, but, you know, as part of that, you might not be, you know, part of the original rollout window. You'll you'll get it whenever it comes later, right? So, like, whenever your period of time that you've designated for updates is open, uh, you'll get the update then. Um, and the other one, I think, is uh, specifically to the problem you were having. Were you logged into the system, or were you just wa uh, watching remotely somehow, or what? I mean, my first time, I didn't catch it. I, I didn't realize it was updating because I didn't log in right away, but, you know, when I was iterating on my, my the configuration that I was working on, I would log in right away, and then all of a sudden yeah. it would just reboot, and I was like, "What the heck is this?" And then I was like, "Oh yeah, uh, auto updates." Yeah, um, I think there might be a feature request to basically say, if there's anybody that's that's logged into the system, like either SSH or you know logged in on the serial console somehow, um, to disallow, basically print a wall message to the screen and say, you know, I. We've staged an update and it's going to reboot when you log out or something like that. Um, I, I'll have to track down that feature request. I think it exists. But does one of those two things help? Yeah, uh, yeah I think it, it does definitely help. And I also think, you know, as we, you know, see more individuals consuming Fedora CoreOS, um, you know, for their individual servers that are clustered, uh, having some sort of uh, more user friendly method of like, consuming the update, like you give them control, be like, yeah, I don't know what that would look like either through, um, I, don't, I don't really know what the point that I'm trying to get. I think if anything, it's just you want individuals to say, hey, this is when I want the update to happen. Right. And obviously I disabled automatic update or automatic reboots. It will stage a reboot, but then I have to reboot. Oh, um, really? Okay. Yeah, so I, I think that it just, you know, one of those little gotchas of, of learning a new system. And I, for the record, I think that forced updates are great in a lot of ways because, you know, it's always easy to, de to defer. Oh, I'll, I'll, I'll update later. You know, that's always the system in's idea. Well, right. I'll schedule this for later. So I think it's a good, it's a good mentality to be in. Yeah. It's kind of interesting. I, the philosophy behind it is one that's easy to reject. Um, and, and I'll go through an anecdote here. So when I first started at Red Hat, I, um, I worked as a consultant for one company, uh, for a little while and they did everything in Amazon AWS. They were one of, you know, 2008 doing everything in Amazon AWS, right? Um, I didn't start working there in, until later, but you know, they, they were a very early adopter of AWS. And one thing that they did is, you know, their systems in the office were all, you know, just dumb systems, be it Windows or Linux or whatever. Everything that was interesting they did on development hosts running in AWS and people would log into them. They had their home partition that was essentially mounted um, as an EBS volume. Uh, but every week um, there's like, I guess, what was there like 12 different development hosts that everybody shared? It was a small shop. But every week, like four of them would get rotated. Right, and they'd get removed, and and new ones would come up. Uh, and basically, what that means is you don't store anything on that system that's not going to get blown away after a period of time. You know, if you do some long running process that you need, um, you know, you better kind of store that in your home partition somehow and automate bringing it up again on the new one. Or you know, any sort of state does not accumulate over time. Uh, so you know. Uh, every two weeks or so, your development host is going away, and you need to make sure that whatever you're doing, you know, by default, your philosophy is, all right, I need to save this state of whatever I'm doing if it's going to be a long-running thing. And so, you know, originally you're like, ah, but I, every time, but I don't want to. And then after a little while, it's just like, okay, yeah, I, you know, my approach to how I've built things now is that this doesn't matter anymore. Right, it's just a different mindset to get into. Um, so once you yeah. get to that point, it's like, all right, no biggie. New update just came through. I'm good. 
yeah, it's it's hard to move from the you know keep treating your servers as uh, pets versus cattle, right? And I think Fedora Core OS helps you kind of nudge closer to the cattle uh, uh, side of the world uh, for running infrastructure, which is I think really great in a lot of ways. Yeah, David says. Uh, don't starve all the other systems by doing all updates at the same time. <laughs> One thing that should help with that, David, is each system um, Each system is unique in the rollout window. Uh, so if you don't explicitly define, you know, what your uh, risk level, risk tolerance level is for updates, then a random one is cho chosen. So uh, you could get an update at 1% of the rollout window for one machine or 60% for another one or 70% for another one. Um, so all of your updates won't update at the same time unless you've explicitly set uh, a risk factor that you um, have chosen to use. And then, you know, if it's part of a cluster, uh, the cluster itself can kind of control updates. We have um, a tool called FleetLock. Uh, which I haven't used and probably needs a little bit of, of you know, more thought and love um, to kind of make that happen. But the concept there is your cluster uh, can help control how many nodes are down at a particular time for an update and stuff like that. Sorry, airlock. You're right, Micah, airlock. I don't know why I call it fleet lot. Nasir, are you talking to us? You're muted. Can't hear you. You might want to use the chat. Had my mic disabled. <laughs> so what I was saying was uh, we have just um, one minute left if I'm right. Yes. Yep. Uh, so hopefully everybody enjoyed uh, everybody enjoyed the tutorials. And um, if you would, please do share with other people who are interested or just you know on social media. Um, the tutorials are in our documentation. In the past, what we've done is we've made like a blog post or something like that. Uh, but I feel like the work that we've done this time to get them into our actual documentation will go a long way um, for people discovering them and you know making them more easily accessible. So please share those, and uh, you know if you find issues, open pull requests. We we welcome contributions. So thank you so much. <laughs>